What's up everyone? Dave and Alan here with yet another DIY machine video. Prior to building our fully automated plastic injection machine, we had actually built an extremely small desktop size version. It's literally small enough to fit on any desktop and today we're showing you step by step how we built it. So let's get right into it. Industrial injection machines are way too big for us hobbyists. This is why my brother and I opted to create Injecto, a tiny desktop sized plastic injection machine. All this machine requires to operate, literally, is an electrical socket and an air compressor. To operate it, you simply press the injection button which activates the dual pneumatic cylinders on the sides to pull down the injection ram and squeeze out the heated plastic. All that's left to do now is install your mold below and you're ready to replicate parts. To test this machine, we made molds using our DIY CNC machine, which you can check out in the description below, or right up here. This mold, used in our fully automated DIY plastic injection machine, made us hundreds of parts before it was retired. To inject, we simply elevate the mold opening into the injection nozzle, which is spring-loaded, and press the injection button. That's it! You can also use a scissor lift here if your mold is small enough, but our mold was very tall. Once ready, press the button and the machine will inject. Want to do it again? No problem! Just throw some more plastic up top, give it a second to heat up, and then inject again, and again, and again. You can also use other molds, like these lid molds we made here, to complete our enclosure with a nice press fit. Alright, let's crack this machine open and see what's inside. Our first step is for you to hit that subscribe button at the bottom right of your video. The second step was to design the aluminum frame. While we could have gone fancy with welding all the parts together or making parts that slide into each other for better stability and support, our goal was to keep this super simple. That way you don't need a machine shop at home. If all you have is a hand drill, well, you can still build most of this. As an example, note that the frame pieces here are all held together with brackets. We use these brackets to make all of our connections, and this worked out super nicely now that they're perfectly tucked inside the box. It's also nice that this bracket acts as a shelf to support this bar up here, because it's exposed to very high stresses from the cylinders pulling right down on it. Now another key factor you may have already noticed is that we decided to use standard 3 inch aluminum flat bar because it's one of the cheapest and easiest raw aluminum parts to get. Next is our heated injection chamber which you can see here in red. It's literally just a piece of aluminum round stock that we turned on a lathe to get this final shape. In our second iteration, which you're going to be seeing later this year, we're definitely going to use steel. But for our prototype, this worked just fine. It's tapered at the top to act as a funnel for the pellets at the inlet, and you can see here that I've already designed a funnel extension for our V2, which holds more than double the pellets, so you don't need to refill as often. This entire tube is wrapped by heater bands which are not shown in the CAD model, but you can see them right here. We've covered them with a silica sleeve to reduce any heat losses, and it worked really well actually. To further cool the frame though, we used a big fan here that circulates air from this single vent. This design forces the air to travel across all these aluminum surfaces, which cools them down very effectively. In fact, after an hour of operation, you can touch the frame with absolutely no problem. The silica cloth, which by the way can withstand insane temperatures of up to 2300 Fahrenheit, also protects the red tube from losing too much heat in this process. But losing some heat is actually good. Why? Because it gives the temperature controller more authority over the tube temperature if we can heat and cool much more rapidly. Otherwise, these heater bands are so powerful that they easily overheat the tube, which can burn the plastic inside as seen by the white striations in this picture. Next, we want the tube to be compliant when we push it up against the mold, so we mounted it on springs from the bottom side. Now the nozzle can plunge right into the mold opening with sufficient force to keep it mated during the injection. When we make the V2, if we use bigger cylinders and produce more injection force, then we'll probably need to use bigger springs here as well to prevent these two from coming apart during injection. But for all the molds we've used so far, it hasn't been an issue. Another issue we've had was holding this hot tube in position without losing too much heat to the aluminum frame. But what ended up working super well is this ultra cheap design using four screws. Since both the screw heads and the pipe are round, their surface area contact is effectively zero. So the tube is always stable with respect to the side to side movement and loses almost no heat by conduction to the frame here. 
At the top, the tube is just mounted onto steel spacers to reduce the contact area for the heat transfer. This nozzle is just threaded into the heated tube with pipe threads. These are tapered threads used for fluids usually to prevent leaking, and in our case, this connection doesn't leak any plastic. For the record, there are no gaskets inside. Thanks to this design, the nozzle can now be replaced very easily at any point, whether it's to use a smaller nozzle size or just replace a worn out one. And that's it for our heated plastic chamber. Now, when the plastic is hot here, we want to plunge this precision ground shaft into the long hole of the heated chamber, where it has a super tight fit. This, of course, will force all the plastic right out through this end. To pull this shaft down, we use two pneumatic cylinders with a crossbar in between. These are both two inches in diameter, which, at a pressure of 120 psi, yields a force of over 3,000 newtons total. I've already upgraded these to 4 inch cylinders in our V2 design, which will produce over 13,000 newtons of force. For the record, that's equivalent to 1.3 tons pushing down on that shaft. So quite honestly, I'm freaking excited for the V2. And that's all for the mechanical design. Let's now talk about the guts of the machine. To access what's inside, you open up these four screws, and you've already seen what's there. Here, there are two main systems at play, electrical and pneumatic. Starting with the air system, we feed our compressor right into this through wall quick connect. That passes the air neatly into our electrical solenoid. When the injection button is pressed, the solenoid receives 110 volts and opens the path for the air to travel into these tubes, which lead the air to the top of the injection cylinder. To explain this better to anyone who's unfamiliar, let me show you the CAD for these cylinders. When we remove the cylinder, we find the plunger working just like a normal syringe. As you force air from the top, it pushes down on this surface, which forces the entire shaft down. This is how our injection happens. When we release our injection button, the air is automatically directed to the bottom of the cylinders via these tubes. This pushes on the bottom of our syringe plungers here and forces the ram up. This acts as a safety feature so that if you let go of the button in the middle of an injection because something got in the way of the ram, the ram's immediately gonna go up. Our connections to the solenoid are made with T-adapters, and at the pneumatic cylinders we use these elbow brackets, but other than that, there's nothing more to the air system. It's really quite simple. So let's move on to the electrical. We start with a standard power cord that you would use for your computer or screen and so on, and plug it into the machine. Here you have the main power switch. Looking at this same connection on the inside, our first step was to ground it with the yellow wire to our frame, since our frame is all metal. From there, the phase is split amongst four loads. The first wire carries power to our main injection button, which is used to connect and disconnect the phase before routing the current back to the solenoid. The next wire comes to this junction block, which powers up the fan as soon as we turn on the machine, and also sends a wire out to our main PID temperature controller. Our fourth and last wire connects to this solid state relay, which is essentially just a switch that is activated electronically by our temperature controller. Whenever the temperature controller senses that the temperature is too low, it opens the switch, which channels the current to our heating elements, thereby turning them on. To actually measure the temperature, we use a K-type thermocouple, which we mounted just above the nozzle. Is this a problem? Well, yes. Ideally, you would want the thermocouples all around to monitor temperature. Feel free to suggest where I should put the thermocouple, because that's what I'm going to do for the V2. Thanks in advance. For now, this just seems to be one of the flaws for this prototype. So let's go into the shop and inject some parts. To start off, we plug the machine into a 110 volt power source and give the injection chamber about 2 minutes to heat up. We know when it's ready thanks to our small temperature display. Since we're using ABS plastic, our optimal nozzle temperature is around 220 degrees Celsius. To change that for use with a different plastic, just press these arrows and it will automatically save for the next time you use it. While we wait for it to heat up on startup, let's plug in the compressor. As a reminder, this will force the cylinders on the side to go up in preparation for the injection. At any point, you can fill your tube with extra plastic and then stick in your mold. We just push our mold up and place a random spacer down below to keep it up against the nozzle. Then we do a random countdown and press our injection button. I usually like to hold the back pressure for a few extra seconds until the plastic can cool and harden, so it doesn't flow back out. That's it, the part can now be extracted. Just before we take it out, for anyone who's interested how much plastic this machine can inject, we did a quick test here. We injected the entire volume of tube, and once it hardened, we put it on a scale.
27.6 grams of plastic is way more than sufficient for any of our home projects. So I'm super duper happy with this. For your reference, these cases we're making here are only 17 grams. So back to our molds. Let's open them up and see what we've got. We've machined notches in them where these screwdrivers are going to pry. The injection was successful and the parts, they look sellable. However, these parts have a tendency to really stick in the molds, so my hands won't do the trick. Instead, I like to place the molds down on the vise and go to town with the hammer. By the way, these ejection pins are what make it super duper easy for us to extract the part. And speaking of which, here's another one for the count. With another successful run, we've been extremely happy with this tiny desktop sized plastic injection molding machine. But is it perfect? Well, no. So on that note, that's it for me. I'll let Alan cover the downsides while I unplug the machine to power it down. Our main issue with this machine is that it can't produce enough pressure to inject molds larger than this. Although quite honestly, this is already a huge mold to inject. Although there are many design aspects to improve on, this prototype was sufficient for proof of concept for our idea. And the end results looked promising. We plan to iterate on this design and create a bulletproof concept that will make available to all you viewers. In the meantime, it would really help us progress if you shared this video with others and more importantly, subscribe right now if you haven't already. We'll see you next time at the Action Box.